So our next speaker was the one who disappeared uh, 12 minutes ago and just reappeared much bigger than he used to be uh, when he was there before. Let me introduce you to Stephen Beekman, the greatest data scientist of Belgium. Look at him. Look at him, how big he is. <laughs> All right, let's see. Does this work? Yeah. Uh, thank you, Philip, uh, Mr. Smallest, uh, data scientist of Belgium. Um, I don't consider myself as a real uh, data scientist. Um, I'm just somebody who plays around. Uh, and I also work for the army, uh, the Belgian defense. Um, I don't know how much longer we will exist, but let's assume we stay alive. Um, if the politicians uh, decide to keep us, and if the politicians decide to keep us, that means you want to keep us too. I'm also a volunteer at Startup Bus, uh, and I will explain those things uh, in the next few slides. So what follows is also my personal opinion. Um, just so you know that. Um, what is there to defend in Belgium? Of course, the production of our beers. Uh, we also have our fries. They're not French, they're Belgian. Uh, and of course, our delicious chocolates, which are not really Swiss, but really, really Belgian. Um, also, Startup Bus, what is it? It is an international competition. Um, we have lots of competitions, one in the States, uh, one in Europe, one in Africa, and also one in uh, uh, Australia. And we actually drive a few buses around and for three days to a central point, starting from uh, lots of countries. And they have to develop new startups in three days uh, from scratch and be able to launch them afterwards. So it's a three-day hackathon on wheels. Um, it's also an exercise in not sleeping. Uh, it's very hard. Sometimes people fall asleep at very uh, ambitious locations like Google Zurich. Um, but basically, Startup Bus, it, it, yeah, it makes people more entrepreneurial. It empowers the people who want to disrupt the status quo. Um, and that's actually what the government needs. Um, government, typically, it was something very boring. People don't come outside and they don't get in touch with real life, with uh, startup companies. Um, Hans, I really hurt you if you're still here. Um, yeah. Um, and times are changing, even the Wall Street Journal is changing its own newspaper. Um, their marketplace section, it's now called business and technology. Why? Because business is becoming more and more technology driven. Uh, and the same thing is true for the public sector. Uh, we should get away with all the paperwork and the old school uh, processes and we should digitalize them. And we're actually doing that already. Uh, and yeah, in the next 10 minutes, I hope to explain how we do that in the army. So the Belgian army, um, for those who don't know how big we are, we have around 33,000 people. Uh, 30,000 of them are military, and then you have 3,000 civilians. I'm one of those. Um, we're divided in, in around 200 units. Um, but let's, see the, let's look at the context. So this is a map. Uh, I just took a screenshot of that. Um, how's the pointer? Yeah. Yeah. So... All the dots you see here, that's where there's a conflict, an armed conflict. So Europe, pretty much nothing. It's, we should be lucky with that. But Ukraine is all in the news. Um, Syria and Iraq, um, Afghanistan too, even Pakistan, the entire Southeast Asia, uh, pretty much Northern Africa. Uh, so, yeah, it's, there's lots of conflicts in, in the world. So an army, you still need it, even though you're still safe here. It doesn't mean all the other places don't have to become safe. Okay, next slide. Yeah. So what does the Belgian army do in the world? Um, of course, we defend our own Belgians. Um, but we also try to train new democracies. So in Africa, there's lots of work, Afghanistan. Um, we were also, um, yeah, the Russians, they're back. Um, they're flying with their bombers all over the Baltics, even trying to get to the UK. And we have Belgian F-16s in Poland uh, protecting their air airspace. Um, even the smaller Baltic states, they don't have an air force. So they depend on NATO to, uh, to defend their own airspace. Um, there's also an economic reason. So lots of Belgian ships are in uh, the, uh, the Indian Ocean. And there is a European mission there uh, trying to protect the European ships uh, against pirates. It's something strange because we only know them from the movies. Um, another thing the Belgian army does is cutting money. We're here to make the Belgian budget break even. Um, 
if you look at this, we're not the only country. Uh, so this is the defense expenditure as a percent of the GDP. And from the 90s, it's going from almost 3% to less than 1% we're spending to defense. Um, for the record, the US defense expenditure is around 4%. And Russia, of course, is also a bit higher than what we are spending. Uh, and I'm not even talking about China. So cutting money is our main driver to become data-driven um, because we have a few questions. Um, what do we do? Uh, the Army is a, l a large organization. Uh, what does it cost what we do? What will it cost? What are we going to do in the next year? Uh, what did it cost in the past few uh, events? And do we actually still need to spend money on it? Um, and that's typically something, if you're not an IT person, that's what you do with Excel files and access databases. Um, but we're luckily trying to move away from that. So in the 70s and 80s, we built lots of uh, software applications in-house. Uh, who here likes SAP? There's one, two. Uh, sorry, SAP guy. Uh, who here likes PeopleSoft? Nobody? Ouch. Uh, we're actually getting PeopleSoft inside for an HR application. Um, at our peak time, we had around 200 applications built. Um, and you should know our um, applications, they have a functional owner, so it is a business driver. And then there is also a sponsor inside the army who says, OK, we're going to spend time on developing the app, yes or no. Um, the problem with that is they generate lots of data, and data is there to be used. Uh, up until 2009, there was no easy access to all that data. Uh, people had to have requests, uh, ad hoc access to their databases. Um, but in 2009, we finally started to change that. Uh, another problem we have, we are hugely decentralized. We're uh, working in theater, but the network links are not reliable or very slow uh, or very costly. So we cannot afford to pump gigabytes of data uh, in real time to theater. Uh, just an example, in Jordan, we have a few F-16s there. And that requires a lot of administration and logistical work. Um, so basically, the army, just like the government in itself and every big organization, it's an ensemble of walled gardens or silos. And everybody wants something from the other garden or the other silo, but they don't realize it's things uh, are at the other side of the wall. Um, and this is what schematically everybody wants to do. They want to get data from HR, the material guys, the finance guys, the operations guys. Uh, everybody wants data from everybody. And that looks like a spaghetti. Uh, so how did we tear down those walls? Um, given our custom requirements, like central access points, which everybody needs, of course, um, we also had to respect the bandwidth issues um, and take into account the decentralized nodes for local reporting needs. Um, also, some data is not supposed to be open, not even within the organization, so we need to have a protection layer. And there was also no real-time need, need for the corporate data. Uh, so we invented what we call the cross-domain data exploitation concept, um, where we try to gather all the data centralized and then ventilate them to all the local nodes uh, who want to do some things. We're not volume-based, uh, we're more variety-based, so we attack each night 32 source databases. Uh, it's zipped, not even 100 gigabytes, so it's very small. Um, but it's more than 1 billion records extracted every night and more than 1,000 data sets. Um, and we have around 400 people working on the data and then distributing the data to their own local users. Uh, so how do we do that? Um, at the nodes, we have built our own custom local reporting framework, which requires a bit too much of training. And this is an example. I hope you can read it. Um, so this is the cost sheet of one training activity with this very sexy name. Uh, it's something in Portugal, and around 400 people are there for 40 days. So I guess it's a training mission for the Air Force. Uh, and in the columns, we actually integrate data from different sources. Uh, so the planning phases, and then the things almost in real time, and then the costs per cost center uh, a few months later. And this used to take around four people working for four weeks to gather all that data. And now it's just one click. Um, 
And if you want to see, look at the specs, there's even matrices here. I don't know, when's the last time you wrote down something with a matrix notation? Uh, well, it doesn't happen that often, luckily. Um, we also do a real-time thing, so I said our framework wasn't really real-time needed, but sometimes we do have a real-time need. This one plots the positions of the, all the planes we have. So at the time I took the screenshot, lots of them were flying in Belgium, but we even had some in uh, Africa and some one coming back from Afghanistan, I think. Uh, yeah, and nobody in the States, which is okay, I guess. So, what did we learn from this? Um, opening up, it's very important, and it facilitates innovation because it takes the central point of IT away from it. People can do their own self-service business intelligence, and we're not standing in the way. And even as a government, what we do, what we don't do enough, uh, yeah, we should do that more. Get out of the way of the startups and even the bigger corporations and and. Uh, our civilians, ourselves. Um, and it also leads to a more efficient organization. Uh, like I said, we saved for one project, we saved four people. Uh, and we have to do that because we're losing people with all the pensions in the next few years. Um, I think what we want to do in the future, yeah, uh, we want to push for better integration. Integration is what uh, makes it more efficient. Uh, and we also want to invest in tools like the notebooks, uh, and, and for Spark, uh, maybe as a real-time need. Something every company is also uh, involved with is the data quality of the data they have. It's very important, and I think making it more explicit is a, a very important thing. And I think then my time's up. Half a minute? Yeah, I'm gonna leave it there. I had some things for the minister, but he's not here anymore, so. <laughs> Thank you. So this is an unusual presentation. I'm so happy that somebody from the government came down here. So uh, we have time for one question. So who would like to ask the one question of the day? Come on. Um, oh, well, uh, the question is not too technical, but I was surprised when I saw your picture where you, you gather all the data from the different sources that you adopt mostly uh, MySQL databases r rather than I would have expected some kind of NoSQL solution, some kind of something that scales better. And, and what's the question exactly? What the prizes? Of no, no, what's, what, 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 what's the reason? Is there a reason why you, you adopted, uh, you, you didn't adopt a big data technology? Um, um, and I think, the, the, and it's actually for lots of parts within the, the organization and the government and the bigger organizations, it's uh, especially when you have an older uh, demography inside your organization who doesn't come out a lot. Um, you need to stay in touch with your environment. Um, like Hans said, um, he had to go to the States and learn things there, and then he came back. And that's when people realized, oh, there's something nice going on outside of what we're doing. Um, and in one of the next slides, uh, I, I was going to show data uh, innovation. It comes from the outside. It rarely comes from the inside. And staying in touch with your context, it's, it's very important to do that. And I think that's the reason why we don't have adopted anything big data tools just yet, but we're getting into MongoDB. So uh, if that's a positive thing for you, I hope you're happy with that. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you.